Hello, world. Patricia O'Connor and Frida Reba Darcy here. Today on the balcony, we're going to talk about what we've been doing here. We've been here about four years. Four years now. I've been hanging out on this balcony. I started off during uh, uh, the summer that I moved in, setting out to decorate the apartment that I had just moved into, having simplified my life, something massive. And I had a decorating idea that didn't fly quite with my landlord. They asked me not to put all of those uh, wisterias and honeysuckle and jasmine that I had growing in between those slats that they had just rebuilt the patios on. So I said that I would take those out and um, I had already had the idea that I would like to maybe try bonsai. So I took one of the leftover wisterias and started that little, this little, this little guy right here. That was a clone. That's the white wisteria that I get to enjoy blooming every year. And uh, that one little, that one little beginning started us, started this little, this little dog and pony show that um, is Patricia O'Connor and Freeber Reba Darcy and the Bondi Balcony. All kind of spun off of that one little wisteria. I've since moved on from wisteria. I don't really have a whole lot of interest in starting anymore. I like them. I like them fine. I think they're really pretty. And uh, I've learned a little bit about them because I watched a trillion videos about uh, how to maintain them and how to ramify them and how to grow them and all that stuff. And uh, in that four years, I also got quite interested in the beginning at maples. And to that, to that end, my interest in those has waned a little. I mean, I've just, it's not that I'm, um, it's not that I'm less, I love them less than I, than I did when I started. It's that I've grown to love bonsai more and I've grown to love other species of bonsai more. Kind of leaving them in the dust. I'm still not ready to part with my uh, trident maple. It's coming along really nice and I like the looks of it. My Dawn Redwood, my Oaks, we're all loving all of these trees. But in the last four years, we have learned a little since uh, since I was 11 years old in 1970. Um, then there were there was no internet. You couldn't go to the internet and just look at videos the way you can now. I had the books that were in our public library, and. Actually, that was it. I had the books in our public library and anything I could find on a magazine rack or, you know, in a bookstore. So uh, that wasn't a lot to learn from. Probably saw Peter Hahn's books, although I don't remember any. At that time, I also had the attention span of a squirrel. So my idea of books was to uh, scan them and look through the pages and read the parts that... Um, jumped out at you and and then come back to them whenever you thought you needed something else. So I, I probably didn't thoroughly take in information the kind of way I'm hungry to do now. Um, mistakes. In the past four years uh, of doing this, I have made a couple of mistakes. Um, I would say building this shelf and this gutter was a good proactive move on my part. I'm not running the risk of uh, investing my heart and my checkbook in a bonsai tree only to have the landlord tell me, hey, no, that's in violation of your lease and you got to go. I'm kind of independent of them in that we built our own little parts here and we're kind of um, and we're kind of making good use, making good use of those other mistakes. Um, when you hear that a tree loves water and that, you, that it loves water really well and it's in a bonsai pot, uh, planting this guy in potting mix for me was a mistake. That meant that even as a wisteria, the uh, soil stayed wet too long. It never dried out in between waterings, which uh, invited white flies and all those other problems. And I almost lost I almost lost that little wisteria by um, watering too much a tree that they say is really hard to overwater. So when you put something in a bonsai pot, it's still important that in between waterings that the tree dries out. Um, 
Having said that, you can also set a uh, wisteria in a tray of water. So that was just one thing. Another little thing is, uh, little things that I picked up in the early going that, that's helpful, is uh, you don't have to learn everything all at once. Just kind of try to focus on the things that will uh, ensure, like if you've got a tree and you like it and you bring it home and you don't know what the hell to do, well, you know at some point it's going to need water. Focus on finding out how much water and how often. Focus on how to look at the top of the soil and see whether or not it's wet or dry or, you know, and how often you need to check that and how often you need to be doing stuff. The other thing is light will kill it next. Lack of light or too much light. So if it's an outdoor tree, find an outdoor space. If it's an outdoor full sun, sun tree, that's just what that means. If it's a, a outdoor tree that requires full sun and you don't have a yard to supply full sun, then do you have the wherewithal to supply um, artificial full sun? So that can be an option there as well. Um, I had said in the early beginning, in the early beginning, that's really good, Pat. I had said in the early going that uh, growing trees that are local, that you see locally, is a great tip for anybody, really, when it comes down to it. You know, the stuff that grows, like if you're sitting at a red light and you kind of scan around the neighborhood when you're out in, in suburbia and you just see what grows, what grows around here. That's the stuff that you should probably be able to grow in a bonsai pot without, without an enormous amount of trouble. Having said that, uh, kind of what goes along with that is what I'm showing you now. My friend Nigel in Canada of the Bonsai Zone stated what I think is a pretty good rule. Don't have any trees you can't carry in your car. This would be an example of a tree I can't carry in my car. Also to that extent, I did carry that in my car when I bought it. I haven't had a car since then that it would fit in. That would be a van. Um, that would be a van, if not a cube. So yeah, uh, growing things that are local means that you're probably not going to have to stretch, you know, stick your neck out too far in the horticulture end of it to keep it alive and happy. And uh, growing things that uh, that are that you can move and that you can um, that you can um, yeah that you can move that's important. You may want to it's important to take your trees to a bonsai show. You may want to sell your trees. You may want to move your trees. You may want to move the location of your trees. Having something that's too big, that's too big for you to move or too big for you to take somewhere is not is not convenient. When it comes to growing what grows locally, I kind of broke that rule when it comes to the ponderosas. These two are two of three ponderosa pines that I have owned in the four years that I got to bonsai. And the one, this one, uh, I ordered it at the same time I ordered a much larger tree. I knew that I was that larger tree would be coming in a large pot. I knew that it would probably have some dead spaces in it. So I ordered that tree knowing that I would pretty much get to ship it for free, which is how that went down. I also lost a bigger tree earlier this year. And um, I lost it at a time when we were having more seasonal rain than I think we've ever had. But while at the same time, I don't I don't blame it on that. I say when I got the tree, it had issues uh, because like a couple of my trees have had issues with getting shipped here in a timely manner. I've had a couple of trees get lost in shipping. Uh, this tree came to me after being AWOL for weeks. The ponderosa pine, that came, the big one that came with that, that little uh, literati windswept that you see there, it came to me several weeks in shipping and looked pale. And uh, I think that was probably strike one for that guy. I think it's like the rule of thumb. It's not usually one thing, it's three things. And um, the, rule of one, the rule of thumb is actually like, I think of it as the rule of threes. Uh, it's like when you're in the zen of, 
of motorcycle maintenance when you're on the side of the road that one thing that you found is probably one of three so yeah um that's kind of how that went i lost i lost one of those trees to that and it, the jury is out as to whether or not i live in an area uh where this tree thrives i know people who have these uh, around me i've had people tell me absolutely not to worry about them i've also had people say that they are concerned about them and have shipped their trees uh you know we have little little weird little climate clicks all around here i could probably drive the drive the trees uphill 40 miles and being a part of the uh and being a part of of this county where it still gets snow in the winter and that might make all the difference they're supposed to get an x number amount of cold every year however what we get is just temperate i mean like today it's june 28th and it's been um the high 50s all day so it's you know if we don't get the freeze we certainly don't give give the trees massively hot temperatures much and i've got more to learn about that you can be in a zone or not be in a zone but it might be there's really nothing about your zone that would ever um, that would ever be fatal to your trees even if it's not quite a perfect fit number wise i know my black pines do well here uh and they've been fun to grow which leads to another tip when it comes to trees that are tricky get a bunch of cheap ones you'll learn more about growing them you'll learn more about wiring them you'll learn more about potting them and feeding them and needle pruning and uh everything else if you have if you have 10 instead of one so that was that was another tip that i learned early on that really is beneficial my my uh, confidence with Japanese black pines went way up after I started uh, because I had a bunch of them. This guy, this guy looks really lush and green. And that's because I, um, I got off my butt and learned about it and did a little bit more research and learned a little bit more about feeding. And there is a lot to learn about feeding you can overfeed bonsai trees and you start to lose your proportion. This guy is an example of what happens if you overfeed one and it starts to grow up too tall and you get some kind of thing happening with the nodes that blows your styling plan. That would be a video for another day if it hadn't been already. But um, what I learned to do was just go with the little pellets that you see here, those little fertilizer pellets. They leave a little stain in the soil. I don't think it really hurts anything. You can also take those little plastic balls and put those pellets in there. That's a little closer to what they look like when they're baby pellets. Uh, they're uh, organic. So, you know, going in, what you would learn about nutrients is whether or not you want to go, whether or not you want to go synthetic or whether or not you want to go organic. And uh, how much, how many, how long, think of it. Think of it like a throttle and a brake. And you want to know, uh, you know, how much throttle you're going to give it and when you're going to put on, start putting on the brake. And that's kind of a rule of thumb. And then I learned about fertilizer going in. Don't be afraid to learn that stuff. That will help your tree stay greener and happier and will also keep you from making mistakes. That'll cause you to lose some of the proportions of your tree. This tree didn't do hardly anything as far as me being able to restyle it until I picked up my game on feeding. Uh, this tree was probably weakened by my lack of feeding and over pruning. Over pruning a tree that seems like it has an endless amount of energy is a losing game. If you cut it off and it shoots out two and you cut that off and it shoots out four, you're going, wow, this is amazing. I'm going to build a huge tree. No, you're killing it. That's another way to look at it. You're, you're taking its energy out. It's trying hard to counteract that until it can't anymore. So right now we're letting it recover from that. And that was two years ago. So that was what we learned. Feed your trees, take care of your trees, prune and shape your trees the way you're supposed to and the way uh, the experts tell you to. Reinvent the wheel if you need to, but that's part of the learning process. Sometimes learning what not to do 
is to, to learn not to do it is to do it first and then see what that got you. Uh, there were a couple of rules I broke going in and now I see better and there were uh, a couple of times where every rule is also meant to be broken. If you go out in the wild and find a, a Yamadori that's absolutely beautiful, if a styling judge were to walk by in a bonsai, it may not, it may not win the show, but uh, it still could be the best thing in any in any one person's collection. So go easy with what you do permanent in the early goings. That branch that looks ridiculous to you might be the first thing that everybody bends and turns into something magnificent. If only you knew, you would know to do that. So hard to get it back once you cut it, right? Also, maybe in the early going, um, the pots, I, I over potted things. In the early going, I knew that I had a pretty okay design static. So I could take a tree that wasn't necessarily really, really old, and I could put it in a bonsai pot, and I could put it in a nice setting. I just had a little camera shift. I could put it in a very nice setting, and that would say Asian art form. Would it actually say bonsai? No, not really. And to that end, my Chinese wisteria is an overpotted tree that I'm having a hard time keeping short, although I'm still working with it. But it's in a um, rather pricey, large glazed blue done by an artist bonsai pot so it's over potted it's too much pot for the uh for a basically mediocre tree the one i clean it and dress it up and set it on the corner table does it look nice yeah but so does the topiary you know so does so does a base full of roses uh, is it bonsai no that should be probably some killer uh, maple in a finished state with a pot that big that wisteria should probably be in a pot at least a third smaller and uh, be a lot if not a training pot so you know it's okay to love tools that's part of bonsai it's okay to love pot when it's a part of bonsai but um the tendon, but the first thing rookies will do sometimes is they'll go through and they'll spend money on pots that they don't really have a tree for. And maybe they have a tree in mind, but it's the wrong tree for that and they don't know better. Uh, as a rule, it, it's kind of started a long time ago. The things that go in evergreens, evergreen trees tend to go in unglazed pots. The Don Redwood, it's not an evergreen, so it is in a glazed pot. The idea is, is you match the color to something. You know, it could be your surroundings or it could be uh, the color that that uh, is opposite of what the tree looks like to where they're complementary in a way or just something, you know, or it could be a color that you would like to look at combined with that tree plus the winter when there's no leaves to look at. And those are kind of the ideas that you would that you would uh, kick around in your head when you're selecting a pot for a bonsai tree. Uh, don't over pot stuff. Don't put a really, really um, baby nursery tree or clone or something in an expensive bonsai pot. Yeah, it'll look uh, nice and Asian and all that in a design aesthetic, but it's not. And, and in a way, saying it's not bonsai is a little like saying it's not art. It's not really true to say to call somebody else's artwork not art. You don't get to say that you get to pass judgment over whether you think it's good art or not. I think that would be accurate. Um, with my Wisteria clone that's two years old in a $12 bonsai pot, is that bonsai? Yes. Yes, it is. Is it good bonsai? Not particularly. It's a clone. And it blooms every year, which is really pretty and smells really really nice so and plus it's first so there's always you know there can always be better but there's only one first so yeah the heart wants what the heart wants look at all those buds coming out we've got some candle cutting or something i think i've decided to let this guy go this year because i did it last year and yeah i'm just gonna let it go but this is also a good example the 
if you can let's see I'm gonna reach back there and grab it why do we cut candles I <laughs> love this little tree this little this little that's dirt on my finger I love this little tree this little this little bean this little mame was one of the ones that we did we did last last fall it came in a shipment of nine four died this was a tiny tiny little one the other shipment i got those trees looked more like this they were nine or ten inches tall this thing before i bent it wasn't as long as wasn't as long as my finger tiny little tree and but look at it now it's doing really well the needles almost twice as long as the tree so we have i'm not gonna i'm not gonna do a needle i'm not gonna do it i don't think i'm gonna do a candle trap on this guy this yeah i might i might anyway this is what i was gonna show you though that's why we do needles it's not really very all precious as it can be i love what's going on with this little literati bean but on the other hand it's not really bonsai to have it's not very or it's not good bonsai to have needles that are twice as long as the length of your tree but there's a little look at that little guy i just think that i just think that's the cutest this tree sco that's the cutest little tree quick look at our black pines they all seem to be pretty happy this guy got up rooted by a bird it seems to be doing okay uh, this guy just recently got repotted. It seems to be thriving. All of the rest of them, I'm happy to say. Um, Frankenpine, I'm seeing a little needle damage here where it, everything is in a little bit too tight. I could probably work on that maybe this weekend, spreading these guys out a little. The tree's fine and healthy. Like if it were a person, it would say it would say to stay high. Right, it's doing pretty good. Same here, I got a little bit of needle damage with this guy, but this always been a really healthy little tree. Should probably try to sort this out a little better. Everybody's in here a little too tight, but um, that's a good project for this weekend. Sorry about the noise, the guy just drug out the, um, just drug out the, the hose to uh, clean the pavement around the pool. So our buds are all budding out. Whenever you get information from me, you're getting information from somebody who lives in a very, very temperate climate. And when you learn things from your uh, video creators that you trust and whose information is good, we still need to think about where they are in relationship to where we are. I bet a lot of my viewers aren't hanging around in their sweater in June, looking at a 4th of July that, you know, it could be 90 degrees any minute. That happens here this time of year. But right now, we have that San Francisco kind of overcast, kind of clear, in and out kind of day, kind of breezy, and like 56. So what does that mean? That means my black pine repotting season is quite a bit longer than a lot of people's. Um, I don't think I'm in a repotting season now i am uh in the uh thinning of needles and candle cutting but it's it's not exactly the wrong time of you know the weather hasn't changed that much or if any at all from uh just a few moments from just a few weeks ago a month ago when we were uh when we were in the thick of of uh, repotting season so i get away with stuff I do get away with things when it comes to that. My um, my time to, to, you know, and I think the guys up up in uh, the Washington area do that too. I'm looking at some of the bonsai growers and their repotting season is, uh, is a lot longer than uh, other people's potting. You know, when you're going through a typical July or something, that's, <laughs> that's not the best, but um, so, also, when somebody does something or tells you not to do something on a video, that might be very good information, but that also might be uh, geography related. I've seen numerous people 
water their trees with like a watering can and they just pour it over the top. Their idea is, is that it aerates the leaves, it cools the trees, it kind of washes the dust off, it's gonna send any any uh, little funguses or anything that were hanging out on there, it's gonna send them down the road and then they're watering their trees. I happen to know that whenever I've allowed that to happen to my trees, a lot of them, quite a few of them, that that would encourage powdery mildew. However, this year I haven't been seeing that as much. And I have been watering my little Kodahan maples with the watering can sprinkled overhead more. I think the leaves on these trees have finally gotten a little bit longer. And as so as they're not so tiny, they're bigger, they dry out faster. And I seem to be, I think I'm having, I think I'm having less issue with that. Uh, and you can kind of see where I have water on my leaves there. So things that I've learned, well, I've gotten away with growing with artificial light for four years now. My, uh, my trees seem to be thriving, even the most sun hungry of them. These guys were actually getting UV damage on the rail. It's like the places where the sun was just blasting them, was kind of burning and drying out the bark too much. And I thought, that's odd. You know, I'm like, well, I guess not. It, um, you know, they're just getting direct sun. They're concentrated on the base and they're not making big, huge canopies the way they would be in a yard or a field or something to uh, shade their bases any from that because we're pruning them back and stuff. So um, to that extent, uh, my LEDs are, um, keep them, you know, it's probably a little less damaging than the real thing. So that's kind of in a nutshell, what we've picked up, what I picked up on four years. When you're getting into bonsai, try to grow something that's local. If you, if you can, you know, if that stuff, if you can find something that grows well local on the side of the road or in the woods or just when it, you know, on its own without a lot of intervention. That would also be an example of something that you should be able to bonsai if you're just getting your uh, feet wet in the game. Try to avoid things that uh, do not, are not known to do well. Yeah, it's fun to do challenges. To that end, I've grown ponderosa pines when I was not 100% sure that they could live here. The jury's still out on that, but so far I've had one for three years and I've seen uh, our local bonsai garden has had some for 10 plus years. And I don't think their climate is, is different than mine. It's just like six miles from here. Um, I also know some collectors who have them around me and they've told me it was fine, that we were good to go. So having that little bit of information, joining a club, um, joining a club for most people is a fantastic way to get a wealth of information and meet people who are more than happy to help you and teach you. And uh, I, I, I would say that's definitely something that you should consider. Uh, so yeah, that's just kind of a couple of quick things. The things you need to learn going in, uh, how much water it needs, how much light it needs, and uh, what to do about feeding. For me, it made the feeding part was made pretty simple. I went with a five, five, five. Those are the three numbers that you see on the uh, front of the bag of every bag of fertilizer or most bag of nutrients or plant food. And it tells you the ratios of the main, the main three ingredients that we all pivot good plant health on. And uh, if you go, uh, they could, those numbers can be high or low. And by going single digits on all of those, you know that you're probably not going to feed something to your trees that's gonna uh, burn it or um, cause it to uh, stretch out of its proportions and, and make something that you can't cut back or something like that. By going with single digits, you're able to control. You're able to control how much how much it gets a little easier. You're able to uh, do that without fear of uh, overfeeding them. Is kind of what I'm saying. So that's kind of that. If you've got those covered, uh, everything else is a matter of style and taste. Whether you're a clip and grow person, or whether or not you're a wire person, or whether or not you're a wire and a clip and grow person, or whether or not you're just a um, let it grow and see what it does kind of kind of person. There's, uh, there's room for all, and uh, I don't think necessarily any one way is correct. I, um, I like all the tools in my tool bags, 
so to speak. So if there's something to be learned about wiring, we're definitely, we definitely want to know that. And if there's something to be learned about um, clip and grow, that I've got examples here of both. And um, when it comes to my pines, I think that would be a lot more, I think it would be more difficult to do some of the pine work that I've been doing without, without some, uh, without some wire. And yeah, that's about us. That's four years of doing this and kind of a few things that I've picked up. Um, when somebody tells you how often they water, think about that as their trees, their climate given that size of pot. So you have to take that with a grain, a grain of salt. Take the information, but kind of, but kind of use a rule of thumb and common sense when it comes to how much, how little, how often, how hard. So yeah, like and subscribe if you guys haven't already. This was a, um, a little 30 minute spot where I just kind of ran over some, some, some good beginner news. Uh, go easy going in. The things that you start off being interested in, you may burn out on early and your interest may change. And there you are with a thousand yellow bonsai pots. Just, you know, just whatever. Uh, whatever you're uh, fascinated with going in, there is always the there's always a chance that that could rapidly change. So um, give yourself give yourself a little chance to settle in and uh, learn what you like and learn how much light it needs, learn how much water it needs, and uh, if you do that kind of stuff, that'll probably allow you to live another day. And the next thing you need to worry about how you want to keep uh, predators away and or feeding so yeah thank you all so much for watching